One of the things I found interesting back in the day is I was ostracized by several people for preferring two over one. In fact, even when we did the Mass Effect lore run, which was only a few years ago at this point, and by a few I mean like five, <laughs> there were several people who were like, ah, Mass Effect 2 sucks. And, you know, that's fine. I mean, we, we all have different opinions, right? We all have different perspectives. And I will freely admit, I didn't remember how good Mass Effect 1 was until I replayed it for that lore run. I usually remembered it a lot more unfondly. This playthrough helped to solidify that, and when we finally do the review, I'm sure it will there as well. The problem is, I think Mass Effect 2 is just a better game. Now, I want to explain that a little bit. Basically, Mass Effect 2 feels like Mass Effect 1 with more time and polish. A bit of a different focus, of course, and that applies both narratively as well as gameplay-wise. See, one of the big things they do is they try to focus instead on the character stories. I have said for years that the main plot of Mass Effect 2 is weak. I actually don't agree with that anymore. I decided to change my mind on that. It's not as strong as Mass Effect 1's, mostly because it's less of a focus, but it's still strong. It's, it's still good, actually, is a better way to put that, in my opinion. However... Now, what I really want to talk about is the gameplay side of things first, because that's my usual approach. So, as I kind of alluded to last time, Mass Effect 1 is an RPG that happens to be a shooter. Mass Effect 2 is a shooter with RPG mechanics. This is far, 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 far less of an actual RPG. Let's see. Um, they uh, made it so that armor is basically cosmetic, and your weapon choice is pared down to basically a handful of weapons... And there's no, what I mean by this is there's no gear. They basically removed gear from the equation entirely. So equipment, gone. Now there, that's not quite true, but it's more like you unlock access to a pistol, a specific type of pistol, rather than there's a pistol 3 and a pistol 7 and a pistol 12, and with varying stats and mechanics between them. So equipment, gone. Leveling up, simplified. Okay, so that's that's not great. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, one of the things they also did was they tried to pare down the uh, the format of things into a different format entirely, so it's a little less RPG-y, because there's no open world, there's no exploring, there's no running around doing stuff, there's just hitting the next mission and then doing the mission. It's all mission-based at this point. However... <laughs> They did do a few good things. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm so, well, no, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they made your squad actually useful for once. For the first time in the series, the squad actually feels like they're contributing to combat, partially because of buffs and debuffs. But but still, the fact is they can do several things on their own, especially if you set them up right. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty sure I could solo several missions by just standing back and letting Legion deal with things. I know, you don't get them till later, but point remaining. Um, the cover mechanic was added, which... I'm not sure what I think of that one. I probably shouldn't list this under the good changes section. So let's actually, let's move that one later. Because I have, an, I have a third section to talk about. So they made the squad actually useful. They changed it so the global cooldown thing is a little different. So rather than just using spell 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, you've got like your two spells, and they've got their own cooldown timers, and you use them you know, on cooldown. They also made it so that abilities can chain with each other. This is the beginning of that concept, which would be taken even further in future games, but it's still a good concept here. Uh, being able to freeze someone and then explode them, being able to, uh, what is it, warp and then blast or something? I forget the psionic combo, but basically you, you lift, I think it's lift and then warp is what it is. There are several combos you can do, and of course you can set up your squad mates to basically combo off of each other. In fact, you could have all of you being biotics and each of you actually using different abilities, which can work out quite well. They also added the Shields, Barriers, Armor, Health system, which in my opinion was a huge beneficial change for the, system, for the game because it added something like actual ga core gameplay to the game. Which, of course, brings me to my next point. This game actually has boss fights, honest-to-goodness boss fights, which have their own gimmicks and mechanics to them. Some of them, of course, just have health or a unique area you're fighting them in or whatever, but there's actual bosses for once, and that's nice. It's a nice thing. Um, the Paragon and Renegade stuff actually matters for once. I didn't really get into the Paragon Renegade stuff back in Mass Effect 1 because, ultimately, the Renegade stuff didn't feel all that Renegade. And the Paragon stuff just felt normal. Now, I praise the concept of the Paragon Renegade system for the same reason I praise the concept 
of the open palm and the closed fist. I like it as a difference of approach rather than morality. You're still a good guy, no matter what you're doing. You're still playing the hero. It's just how you're getting from point A to point B. Because method does matter. Means matters, not just the end, right? The catch is, in my opinion, as much as I praise the idea in both Jade Empire and in Mass Effect 1, the system was somewhat lacking. It is Mass Effect 2 when the system really comes into its own, because a lot of the renegade choices are actually renegade. They're things that make more sense from a ends justify the means, I'm going to do what is necessary to make things happen kind of mentality. This also works together in one other way. You notice, you're thinking, well, hang on, I thought you were talking about gameplay, not lore. Well, I am. Because the other thing I want to mention is the interrupts. Paragon interrupts and Renegade interrupts are, in my opinion, one of the best ideas ever added to RPG gameplay uh, ever. And I mean that sincerely. The ability to actually intervene in a cutscene based on your particular alignment or preference is something that is awesome and leads to some of the best moments in this game. It gives you more agency, it is completely optional, and it allows you to kind of change the tonality of how you progress. As I've talked about before, my particular Shepard is mostly Paragon, with a substantial amount of Renegade as well, so like a two-to-one ratio kind of a thing. And a lot of that is specifically because of this game, because there are many Renegade options and many Renegade choices that make more sense for the way I, that, that, that she is, that Zaydenra is as a character. And I like that option. By contrast, in Mass Effect 1, it's like 90% Paragon and 10% Renegade. And, uh, yeah, enough said, really. Just, just really quick, before we move forward, what's your favorite interrupts in this game? I can name three right off the top of my head that are my favorites. Uh, the Hug, the Tolly Hug, it's probably one of my favorites. There's also the, you're working too hard, <laughs> And, of course, shoving the guy out of the building. I think those are my three personal favorites. Anyways, <clears throat> so they changed uh, several, several things about the gameplay, refined the, co the, the shooting mechanics, and this leads to the two neutral changes. So the first neutral change is cover, which I just mentioned. Now, if you're a sentinel and you're properly built, then you're probably thinking, what the heck is this cover thing I keep hearing about? But for anyone else, you basically need to run around in cover all the time. Oh yeah, they also added more of a, a health jam thing, which I'm not particularly fond of either. Anyways, so, cover. <laughs> I, I, the problem, in my opinion, is cover-based shooting is kind of boring, in my opinion, because there's nothing really to it. All it is is deciding when you can shoot and where. There's no tactics involved. There's no agency. It's just get in cover, shoot when you can, hide when you can't, and that's all there really is to it. There's nothing, in, my, in, in short, what I'm trying to say is I don't feel there's any real gameplay there. You are punished so severely for not being in cover, unless you're a sentinel, uh, then that you basically have to do it, so it becomes mandatory. So you're just hiding back there, shooting when you can, and there's no, okay, maybe if I do this, or... All right, if I try to jump over here, I can get a better position and get a height advantage or, you know, whatever. None of that is present. Instead, it's just cover-based shooting. So that's why I kind of consider that a... Eh. I don't think it's really a bad change, per se, but I don't think it's a good one. Which leads me to ammo. They decided to add ammo to this game. This is an interesting change because it... Oh, God... From an in-universe, in-lore perspective, they just twist themselves into knots trying to explain this in lore. And they fail. There's still plot holes related to it. Yay! But even ignoring that, they try to make this work. And it, 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 I, know, I know this sounds strange, but it really does fundamentally change the approach of gameplay. Because there are several methods of trying to... Um, how do I phrase this? There are several methods of resource utilization when it comes to core combat gameplay within a video game. There's ammunition. There's uh, slowly regenerating resource. There's generate spend. And then there's cooldowns. Now, there's, there's some other variants as well, but those are the big ones. So in the first game, it was effectively a form of slowly regenerating, by which I mean you would 
shoot and you didn't want to overheat and then you would let it go out and you'd shoot and then you'd let it out. So even though it's kind of the inverse of how it normally goes, what you effectively have is a mana bar, to put it in a simple perspective. So you're spend, spend mana, spend mana, spend mana, let the mana regen, spend mana, spend mana, spend mana. So you can see why it's, it, I, I call these the core uh, gameplay resource allocations, because just about every game falls into these categories in one way or another. So we shift drastically from, you know, the mana bar regen format to the ammunition format. Now ammunition, I know it sounds like a duh, but what it means is ammunition is a format where you have to procure the method by which you attack externally. You have a finite amount, you, you have a cap, and you have however much you have in that, and then it, once it's emptied, you're screwed. The only way to progress is to, is to procure more ammunition somehow externally. Now, this can make playing something like, say, a soldier kind of suck, but that's neither here nor there. The relevant point... I'm not sure why they did this. I know that sounds strange, but there's no inherent benefit or detriment, really, to any of these methods. So changing from, you know, mana management to ammunition management, it's just shifting to a whole new paradigm, effectively. It meant that they had to all of a sudden have, like, everything drop ammunition, and there's ammunition drops all over the place. They had to make it universal ammunition to be able to apply to all the guns equally. Basically, what they did was they, they made it Quake... Well, not even Quake 2, because Quake 2 actually does it better. I can't even think of a good example. They made it really, really basic ammunition gameplay. And again, it's kind of so basic that I don't have much to say about it. It kind of like the cover-based shooting. They don't do anything with it. The ammunition is just there. The only way the ammunition actually matters is for the heavy shots, and that's it. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what can you do with ammunition? Doom 4. There are actually several games that do something like this, but the idea is you build something into the gameplay loop that rewards you with a method to continue the gameplay loop. That's exactly what Doom 4 does. You attack and kill enemies. That refills your, your Doom bar. Uh, or your am your fuel or whatever, you spend that, you destroy enemies, they drop tons of ammo, which allows you to then continue shooting, which allows you to refill the... It just loops back, and out back in on itself. It encourages you to keep going, because the way in which you regen, the way in which you get more ammo, is by doing the thing you're doing anyways, killing. And thus, it becomes all about killing more efficiently, or killing more quickly, because then you are rewarded with better resource management, right? Instead, in this game, it's just... Shrug? I mean, obviously you don't want to miss, but otherwise it's extremely base-level gameplay. And I mention that because I think those are the two biggest flaws of this game. Oh, don't mistake me, I do think the game, the core gameplay, is better than Mass Effect 1's, and I stand by that statement firmly. But I think they made a pretty big misstep well, with the cover-based shooting and with the ammunition swap. God, where to start? Um... Let's start with the plot. I know that sounds like a weird place to start, but I want to start there because it's it's less emphasized since the whole point of this game is to really be big on the characters. They even said in multiple interviews, the whole point is they wanted the side missions to be as interesting and engaging as the main missions, which is admirable and laudable, and actually a lot of games since have taken a similar mentality when it comes to quest design. I would argue there are quite a few games where the side missions are actually better than the main mission. <coughs> Oblivion. <coughs> Skyrim. Excuse, excuse me. Sorry, I had something stuck in my throat there. I'd make a Skyrim joke here about waking up in the car, but let's just move on. The point is, the plot is de-emphasized, but again, I don't actually think it qualifies as bad. And certainly not weak. See, here's the thing. The plot is a natural continuation of what I talked about back in Mass Effect 1. An enemy which you do not know even exists, you cannot prepare to fight. They will have already launched their invasion of you while you are learning who and what they are in order to counteract them. Now, Mass Effect 1 was about trying to, you know, get ahead of that in many ways, and Mass Effect 2 carries that through logically. Now, there are people in, in positions of tremendous power who are now sitting there thinking, okay, Reapers exist. What do we do about it? Well, the first thing we do is we figure out how to fight them. This leads me to the main plot of the game trying to figure out how the Reapers tick, trying to figure out what and how they work, and trying to figure out how to fight them. This is the main plot of Mass Effect 2. Oh, sure, there's the collectors and stopping them and all that, but that that's not actually the main plot. That's the threat. 
The main plot is learning our enemy so that we're ready when the Reapers do actually show up. And that, to me, is a rather worthwhile goal. You'll notice that at almost every stage, so when we first are playing, the Collectors show up at an hour. We don't even know what the Collectors are. We've barely even heard of them. And they just destroy us abstractly because we're completely unprepared. Okay? The next time we encounter them, we're still not really 100% sure what we're fighting, but we have a temporary stopgap to try and prevent them from getting some of their advantages, so we're able to hand them a small defeat. The next time we encounter them, we're fighting them on their turf in what is effectively a trap, but because of the advancements we've made, we were able to survive that trap and get out with more info. And each time, we are better prepared for them until we get to the suicide mission, where... I mean, that can go pretty badly, but one way or another, we do win the suicide mission. We do successfully take out the, the collectors. Hence the main plot. The, the collector threat serves as a truncated story arc of the overall Reaper arc. Each time we encounter them, we are better prepared for them. And better prepared, we win more, basically. This would have all been a logical thing to carry forward into Mass Effect 3 when we understand exactly what we're fighting and are able to fight them on their own terms and defeat them conventionally, but I'm getting off topic. Now, this of course leads me to several of the big events. I mentioned the death scene. Let's talk about that first. I'm going to go ahead and admit that even to this day the death scene catches me, mostly because it is very well executed. It's still a cliche and it's still dumb. I think we can all accept that. I mentioned earlier that Mass Effect 1 clearly sits on a 4 on the most hardness scale for me. Mass Effect 2 slips a little bit down into 3 or 3.5, and a lot of that is because of Project Lazarus, which everyone constantly insists, don't worry, we're not a duplicate, we're not a robot, we're not something that thinks we're the original, we are the original Shepard. The problem is, um, that's basically not how that works at all. <laughs> They have to insist that because it's important for the for the players and for the creators for this to be the shepherd, for this to be the one and only shepherd, which uh, you know we care about at this point in time. One moment. There's a fruit fly buzzing around. I'm not, I'm just gonna ignore it. I'm just ignore it. I hate fruit flies so much. I don't get a lot of them because you know I, I, there's nothing for them to interact with. But every now and again, one flies in from outside. And it's just like oh, there's something here. <sighs> Speaking of fruit flies. After we die, which to this day just gets me, that scene, just, oh my gosh. Uh, there's a scene where we go to the colony, where we can interact with Ashley if she's alive. What I find interesting about this mission, and I think this is probably one of the biggest reasons why people think the main plot of the game is weak, is because the subplot of the game, which is the Collectors, is actually pretty weak. Because if you think about it, what's, what's the most memorable mission in this game for you? Okay, hang on. Rewind. Other than the suicide mission, what's the most memorable mission in the game for you? Now, I don't know your guys' answers, but I will go ahead and say that I can name three or four loyalty missions that come to mind immediately before I even consider the recruitment missions, before I even consider the main missions. The initial uh, tutorial mission, before we actually get our ship, the initial thing on the colony, the invasion of the collector ship, uh, going after the IFF, and finally the suicide mission. Of those, the only one that really sticks out in my mind as particularly memorable and awesome is the suicide mission itself. And that's logical but because of what the suicide mission is, which I'm going to save for talking about later because obviously there's a lot to say about that. So we're just going to move on from the main plot and the subplot because what this game really is about is people and world building. This is the I've said this so many times. This is the Empire Strikes Back of Mass Effect. This is about bringing the scale a little bit down from the large-scale, you know, huge galactic threat that the first game was to, okay, now we have to deal with something a little more small tier. Again, the main plot is understanding our enemy and prepping for it. This then laterally leads into the construction of the game. Recruit, improve. Recruit, improve. We have to recruit a team who have a variety of expertise in a variety of fields so that they will be capable of taking on something like what we're going up against. And then we have to improve them by doing their loyalty missions. And Or I guess because we care about them. I, I don't know. It's up to you guys. It's worth noting, by the way, that Mass Effect 2 carries forward a lot of decisions from Mass Effect 1, but always in small ways. I actually have been criticized before by praising the way they do this, because people are like, well, none of the choices in Mass Effect 1 really matter. And they're right. 
The only choices, I already said this, the only choices in Mass Effect 1 that really matter in 2 are who's alive and who's dead, and who's in charge of the council. That's it. And of those choices, only who's alive and who's dead carries forward to Mass Effect 3. So Mass Effect 1's choices don't have any real influence on the plot. What they do change a lot is the tone. There are basically every little thing you could do in Mass Effect 1, every choice you made, has some consequence in 2. It's usually an extra cutscene, or in some cases it's just a bit of email. Probably one of my favorite. There's a Volus we saw, I can't remember his name, on Novaria. And he basically went into, you know, he went insane. Thinking about, you know, all that happened and the fact that he shut that vent and didn't kill her. Or uh, rather that he didn't save her and he thought maybe he should have died with her, right? You probably know the one I'm talking about. If you don't, don't worry about it. He le leaves you a message because he is now in a shrink ward and they have encouraged him to reach out to talk to us because we went out of our way to save his life in the first game if we bothered to do so. Little stuff like that. That's how Mass Effect 2 acknowledges the choices of 1. And I don't know about you guys, but that's awesome. Ignoring the fact that doing more, doing truly branching narrative, well, let's just say that that's not all that feasible. Not really. The more developed your actual gameplay is, the less possible it is to have truly branching narrative. Something like Detroit Become Human, that was a rarity. And it's worth noting they spent years making a game which has very, very basic gameplay, if you remember, just to have the kind of branching narrative that they had in that game. It is very hard to do. So, logic. So instead what we have is a game where all of those choices make little differences, but it still acknowledges the choices. It still shows consequences of the choices. And the only game that fails to follow through on this is 3, but I'm, I don't want to bash 3 too much in 1 and 2. We'll get there. We'll get there. I love the inferences. I love the little missions. I love the side stuff. I love it. I love meeting, I can't think of her name, the green Asari, who, who, who is still alive and still free thanks to my interactions with the Thorian back in the first game. All of this is good stuff, right? Um, I suppose the next logical thing to talk about would be to just go down the list of characters. Because there are so many. I have a full list here to make sure I don't forget anybody. Let's start by talking about Edie. Now, Edie is exactly what she needs to be. She is an AI in a game that's designed to be uh, a little bit quirky, mostly helpful, have some personality, but also be portrayed in a way that she could be considered an enemy or an ally, depending on how you look at it. But over the course of the game, it becomes clear that she is actually more of an ally than an enemy. Her interactions with Joker, who I barely mentioned in the first game, uh, is, is a good example of her development and growth. It, it probably helps that she's a full AI and not simply a VI, which I use those terms all the time. I basically borrowed them from the game. They stand for artificial intelligence and virtual intelligence. The idea is simple. An AI is, if it is fully developed, a, sem a sentient, sapient being. A VI is not. <laughs> a VI is an intelligent robot or an intelligent program. And AI is something that can develop into true sentience and sapience. That, that's the difference right there. Um, droid effect, for example, can never happen to a VI because a VI lacks one of the key critical elements that is required for droid effect, sufficiently advanced. Now, an AI is not necessarily automatically sentient and sapient, which brings me to my next point about Edie. As weird as this may sound, it is my opinion she is not sentient and sapient, that droid effect has not taken its course at the beginning of the game. It is my opinion that, by the end of the game, Droid Effect has taken its course. And by Mass Effect 3, when she gets a super sexy body for absolutely no reason. Look, she can se look sexy as much as she wants. I'm, I'm not here to judge, it's just... I'll leave it for then. But I do like Edie's interactions with Joker, especially since Joker ends up disliking her so much at first, because... There's this weird ship cancer thing, and I don't know how to deal with it. It's also a good time to mention that Joker's awesome. Seth MacFarlane is actually a pretty good actor and, and actually a very talented person in general, writer and director. Uh, but he usually gets typified as the, as the dumb one or the idiot one because he's so good at playing that. It's nice to see him play someone who, while he is a joker, he's still a person. There's still layers to him. 
there's still additional parts of him that help to flesh him out to make him more of a three-dimensional character. You notice he is far more of a character in two than he was in one. It's not like he wasn't a character in one, you know, but he's much more of a character in two, which is actually true for everyone in Mass Effect 2, which is kind of my point. I think the thing I like about Joker best is that he is a very strange combination of an idealist and a pragmatist. Ultimately, he's just about getting the job done. The whole reason he joins up with Cerberus is because he thinks they're cool and because they're giving him these extremely experimental experiments so he can start to walk, have the barest beginnings of being able to interact in, in, other than you know, requiring a chair, basically. But at the same time, he does have a pretty strong moral center. He's willing to do basically whatever it takes so long as it is in service of the greater cause unless it actually goes over the line. It's a nice little balancing point, and it helps to make him interesting, which, of course, leads me to... Uh, I know this is going to sound like a weird time to bring this up, but I want to talk about the elusive man next. It's really hard for me to pick a favorite character in all of Mass Effect, but the elusive man is definitely in the running on that. He is... He is a fully fleshed out, fully three-dimensional character who is villainous and pragmatic and heroic and idealistic and logical and a liar and tells the truth. <laughs> he is very dynamic and he does whatever he has to do into the circumstances in the way he needs to or wants to depending on his own preferences and how he feels the circumstances demand it. And yet he's not above being sincere since he knows sincerity can work, but more to the point, because and this is just my opinion at this point, I think there is a legitimate sincerity to the elusive man. I don't think that he's just a robot, to put it in simplistic terms. I think there is a human being underneath that, and I think he really does care about a lot of things. I also think, however, that in total contrast to Joker, this is why I'm comparing the two directly, Joker will not cross the line. His ideals trump his pragmatism. The elusive man will cross the line without even hesitating because his pragmatism trumps his idealism. Now this makes sense. Joker is an individual, and the elusive man is in charge of one of the most powerful organizations in the galaxy, at least from a criminal perspective. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that Cerberus has some kind of hidden army and fleet somewhere. That'd be insane. But no, um, my point is that if you spend all of your life looking at the macroscopic perspective and looking at things from the camera as zoomed out as possible in terms of maps and statistics and figures, yeah, it makes sense that you're going to prioritize saving 300,000 people at the expense of 300 people. At that point, it's just math, or you might say cold calculus. So the elusive man, he's not a good guy, but I very much hesitate to call him evil. I think it would be more accurate to say that he is someone who would probably have been a very heroic figure if the Reapers didn't exist. And I mean that sincerely. Don't mistake me. Cerber I don't want to whitewash Cerberus completely. Remember, almost all of the terrible, horrible stuff that happened in Mass Effect 1 and all those side missions, like 90% of that was Cerberus. Oh yeah, so they've decided to do another horrible, terrible experiment of evil doom. But the thing is... Well, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. I think the character I want to most parallel him to is Arcturus Mengsk, although the two are obviously different, since Mengsk was all about himself, whereas the elusive man is all about humanity. But the point being, both use the same concept, whatever it takes to accomplish the goal. And so they just throw morality and ethics completely out the window, because that's in the way. That's going to slow us down, and it's going to prevent us from doing things as quickly and efficiently as we can. I hate to comment on Mass Effect 3 yet again, but there's this one little tiny tidbit where he says I'm, he, he's going to go in for surgery, no anesthesia. And that kind of gets across his mentality right there. Anesthesia, you know, in other words, make, softening the blow and making it easier would just make it take longer and be more difficult and be more difficult to recover from. Instead, he's just going to go in and endure the pain. He applies the same thing to himself that he does to his organization, in short. You can see why I kind of admire the man in a strange way. and So I suppose I should clarify. I, I say he might have been a heroic figure, 
because he might have been the reason, in fact, I've heard people argue he is the reason why humanity actually has a foot in the door at all, despite being, as I paralleled earlier, 40 turns behind in the 4X game. As always, he's a bit of a controversial and, and uh, debatable character, and I would, as ever, love to hear your thoughts on him specifically. Even the, the smaller characters in this game get a decent amount of screen time and, and stuff to them. So, let's start with one of the, the side ones, Zaid. Now, Zaid, of course, is a grizzled, bitter husk of a war veteran who is also a, a specious, apparently. But he's also got... It's weird because he is someone who clearly has a head about him, but mostly... Is it's hard to even tell because how intelligent he is by looking at him because he is actually pretty intelligent and he knows how to think his way through a situation very clearly and very effectively. The catch is his intelligence is completely sublimated by his emotion. He will go completely off the rail if he gets angry or upset or whatever, and that can lead to some very bad things, including one of the more irritating aspects of the loyalty missions. When you recruit him, it's easy. You just go and you talk to him. When you do his loyalty mission, you have another of those hard choices. Do you rescue the people or do you help Zaid? And that's actually pretty... That sounds strange, but that is a surprisingly debatable topic. Because it's not just about helping Zaid. It's about going after a dangerous person who has a lot of wealth, influence, and power who's going to cause a lot of horribleness and death further down the line if you don't stop them. I mean, this is the Batman thing, right? Let me put it to you in, in Batman terms. Do you kill the Joker, or do you save the lives of the ten innocent civilians? Because that's the choice being offered. And, I'm sorry, morality aside, that is a harder choice than it sounds like. Now, Zaid, of course, he intends on going after the Joker. Not for intellectual reasons or because it's the right thing to do, but because screw that guy! He had him hold me down and put a bullet in my head. <laughs> I don't actually have much else to say about Zaid, unfortunately. So, it, 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 as I said, I'm starting at the weak spots because these are the DLC characters. So, let's move on to Kasumi. Kasumi is, of course, the inverse of Zaid. She has, certainly has her emotions, and they certainly are there. And she portrays herself as a big emotional person, uh, but she's not. She is an intellectual at heart, and she is following her mind more than anything else. She is, of course, the infiltrator, and I'd say probably one of the weakest party members in per terms of pure gameplay. Again, her recruit is nothing. Hi! Join! Okay, done. No, it's her loyalty mission which is interesting, which is helping her to resolve something, because... <sighs> so she had a friend who had a chip in his brain that contained memories and stuff like that. And uh, he, her friend is dead. Let's just start with that. He, he's dead. And so you're on a mission with her to go after one of her old rivals in order to procure the chip, and then, you know, that, that's the mission. It's a fun mission. You go as an infiltrator. You're invited to a party. You talk to people. You sneak your way around. It's, it's a nice variance from the, from the typical norm. And I always like this kind of, well, it's not really a Princess Peach section. It's structured as though it is one. Then you have some more traditional fighting, and you defeat some stuff. There's references. You've know, got to have references. And then at the end of it, uh, she has to decide whether to keep this thing or not, which actually does matter for the next game. And we do get a small reference that whatever was on that data was specifically related to the Reapers. Now, that doesn't really follow through as much as I would have liked. But we do, this choice is, again, not as simple as it seems. Because the choice is, do we, you know, do we go ahead and keep the data around? And she you know, gets to interact with her friend and get a little fixative and obsessive about the guy who's dead, but it's okay because he's right there, I can see him, I can talk to him, right? Or do we try and let it go? And again, which one did you go for on that one, right? Anyways. Now Miranda is an interesting one. Miranda is... Miranda is a woman with a dark, troubled past that she's not particularly proud of, and that she has suffered for her entire life. 
but as a consequence, she is using her, the abilities that she gained from this suffrage in order to try and better herself to the ideology she follows. And I'm sorry, I hate her outfit. I've always hated her outfit. I like Miranda as a character, I do. She comes across as crisp and brusque and cold at first. The problem is, she's actually not. She is a far more emo emotional person than she lets on. She's supposed to be about the mission first. And then she'll let her feelings at the doorstop. The problem is, multiple times that is shown to not be true, where she will act out on her emotions before she has anything to do with the actual logic of the situation. Um, <laughs> you're kind of noticing a pattern here, aren't we? Now, I like Miranda partially because once you start to dig into the person behind the professional, you start to see that she's a decent person, that there is someone there who actually does care and wants to not only do good in a general sense, excuse me, in a specific sense, but in a general sense. This is someone who, as she herself puts it, she is not, she is not a human supremacist. She is a human advocate. In other words, humans should have a, the same chair at the table as everyone else, rather than the humans should be on a throne lording over the other ones. There is a big difference between those two things. And Miranda is a firm believer in that equality thing, and it, you can see how she believes in this. And as over the course of the game, we expose her to a lot of actual facts and things which show her just how real things have gotten, that all the crap she's dealt with up into her life is, is frankly nothing compared to the collectors and the reaper threat behind them. This helps to show her a little bit of differing perspective on things. You'll notice there's no real recruit mission for her either. There's, there's a couple more like those. But um, her loyalty mission is interesting because we find out that she is actually a reverse-gendered genetic, genetic clone of a rich guy who is rich, powerful, and probably insane. We actually meet him in three, and yeah, I, I'm going to go with insane on that. At the very least, he's a horrible, disgusting person. Now, in fairness, <laughs> you'd think the big twist here would be, oh my gosh, she's phrasing him as this horrible, horrible, horrible person. Clearly she's wrong. No, he really is that horrible of a person. That's not, the, that's not the morality. No, the morality is what she does with the person who sold her out. Because she has the option to kill him. Just... And the, intellect, the intellectual in her, the mind in her, tells her this is the right thing to do. Kill this guy. Remove him from the equation. But you can tell the heart doesn't want to, and it doesn't take much convincing to convince her not to. Because she doesn't want to do this anyways. He was a friend, after all. And, well, that doesn't go very well, as, you, as you're aware if you played this. But there's this really little bit at the end where she actually reaches out to her sister, who, of course, is smarter than she seems because she's Miranda's sister. Both of them are very smart. So her sister actually has already figured out a bit of what's going on, but the two actually connect and bond over their mutual disdain for, for the society that they exist in and the circumstances that led up to that and their mutual hatred of their father and blah, blah, blah. And so there's something working there. There's, there's the beginnings of a relationship going forward so she can actually be there, which is awesome. She also, I, I mentioned earlier that she is emotional more than intellectual. Probably the best example of that is actually the way in which she kind of slides the, the information about Jacob's father onto Jacob's desk. That's interesting, because it kind of goes out of its way and is completely mission irrelevant, and she's actually scolded a little bit for this. Now, Miranda's actually most in contrast to Jack, but I want to bring up Jacob first. See, Jacob, he's kind of... I'm trying to think how to phrase him. He is probably the most idealistic renegade in the entire game, in the entire franchise, arguably. He is firmly of the renegade mindset, but only in the service of doing good. He is chaotic good. And he says this pretty much right at the beginning. You know, this, this is why I'm with Cerberus. Why am I with Cerberus? Because there's some uh, uh, colonists who are being abducted and we need to deal with it. There's no committee. There's no red tape. There's no debate. We go and we do something about it. That's Jacob in a nutshell, a man of action. You could tell he's kind of a military man, too, especially in the way he takes care of himself and handles himself. He is, in a way, professional, but he's not cold. He's not cool, like you usually associate with that word. Instead, we've got a little bit of the the pro-killer approach, basically. He's probably the most soldier of the group overall. 
as in someone who would work really well as part of an elite unit, hence the obvious reason why he's here. And I have to point out, and this is mentioned in 3, it's probably no ex no mistake that Jacob and Miranda, two of the best as well as most good aligned people in Cerberus, are the ones attached to Shepard for this mission. I've always been of the opinion that Cerberus has its good sides and its bad sides, and like I said, the elusive man accepts it all because pragmatism before ethics and morality. So it makes perfect sense to me that there would be legitimately good people in Cerberus, just like it makes sense there'd be legitimately evil people in Cerberus. And so the elusive man is smart, and he's competent, and it makes perfect sense that he would specifically assign certain crewmen to the Normandy SR2, specifically to make sure that, you know, we see the better side of Cerberus, which is going to make us more likely to actually work with them going forward. Yeah. But back to Jacob for a second. So Jacob, obviously, I actually like Jacob, and I point that out because I've been ousted several times for being weird for liking Jacob. I know I'm not the only one who likes Jacob, though, because I know plenty of people who are upset about him in Mass Effect 3. I can't even get away from talking about Mass Effect 3 in a video about Mass Effect 2, or 1. But no, really, though, for a second. He's... He's the kind of person that I would probably get along with in real life. You know, he's reliable, dependable. Um... But I mentioned that idealism thing. He is very much chaotic good. He is about taking action and doing it to better people, to help people. Let's go. Now, I point that out because one of the things he mentions as one of his core tenets is you always have to own up to something. You do something wrong, you make a mistake, you own up to it immediately. You stand right up and say, yep, it was me. That also fits in with the chaotic good mentality. Someone who, ah, well, that was me. Because remember, it's not about lying or deceiving or maintaining some kind of political facade or trying to, to you know, be like, oh, no, I'm super competent, I didn't make any mistakes. No, instead it's just, I screwed up, I'm sorry. Because the good is the more important part to them. His loyalty mission is messed up. Really, really messed up. It bothers me to this day. Because what happens is he gets... <sighs> He gets a distress call from his dad, thanks to Miranda. I referenced that. And he goes down, and it turns out that they've actually been living on this planet fine for however long, carving out little fiefdoms for themselves. The ship crashed. The officers voted on what to do. They, just, they found out that the food reserves were low, and the local food is possible to use, but it makes them compliant. It basically dulls them down. They're still aware to an extent. And they can still be recovered. We get a message from someone like that afterwards. But it, it dulls their ability to think straight. So the officers set up private harems and little fiefdoms. It is exactly as disgusting as it sounds. And it's the most blatant, petty abuse of power. It's, in my opinion, probably one of the most evil things in the game. I've said this before. For me, evil... Everyone d d determines a gradient of evil differently. For me, more evil is usually about something that's more personal, more insidious. You know, as someone who hits a button to kill 10 million people, in my opinion, is not as bad as someone who does what Jacob's father does. Now, we find out all about all of this thanks to logs and interactions with the NPCs before we actually meet Jacob himself. So we go to meet, uh, excuse me, Jacob's father. I don't even remember his name, and I don't care because he's going to die horribly. We find him, and Jacob is disgusted by him. Now, if he had at least stood up and said, yes, I did this horrible thing, and I'm sorry, please get me out of here, that would be something. I'd still shoot him in his stupid face, but that would be something. But no, he is even more despicable than that. In total contrast to his son, he decides to lie about it. He tries to portray himself as some kind of hero. So, there's a lot of ways to kill him there, and I'm not sure which is best. I, I flip-flop in my opinion every now and again. But as long as he dies, I'm happy. But of course, this kind of gets across the idea of Jacob's own mentality, doesn't it? Because Jacob is not that. Jacob is the opposite of that. That is basically a form of neutral evil. Jacob is not evil. He is chaotic good. Which leads me, of course, to Jack. Now, I know what you're thinking. Hang on, you jumped from Miranda 
to Jacob to Jack. Well, that's because Jacob and Miranda both have their own parallels to Jack. <sighs> See, Jack is actually in many ways the combination of Jacob and Miranda, except inverted. Hear me out for a second. Jack's recruit mission, so we actually have a recruit mission for the first time uh, to go recruit Jack, is uh, awesome, of course, because for some reason they make the horrible mistake of thinking that an entire prison facility full of arms, armed guards is going to stop us. Apparently they haven't heard of us. I'm pretty sure the Geth were harder than you guys. Anyways, <clears throat> so we bust in there and try to bust her out. She is terrifying, uh, even by the standards of several of the other prisoners, so we get a little exposition before we even meet her. She also gets rather cutscene-y. Several characters, this is actually one of the flaws of the game, several characters are much stronger in cutscenes than they are in gameplay, which always irritates me a little bit when that happens. It's not as bad as cutscene incompetence, but cutscene competence, or I guess cutscene overcompetence, I don't know what to call that. Cutscene powers are always kind of irritating to me. Anyways, so Jack is portrayed as a very, very, very powerful uh, biotic. And specifically because of the fact that she was being trained and bred and programmed to be a very powerful biotic, to be a weapon, on you know, to be I forget what they called the assassin ladies we fight in Mass Effect Three. This was the program that developed that, the one that produced her. Now, uh, <clears throat> the mission to recruit her, I don't have much to say about because it's almost entirely about just busting through the prison and the greedy idiot, uh, oh my Turian who actually is just trying to kill us and get more money out of us. This is not the first time that a lot of money is being offered for us, by the way, which kind of sh goes to show how the collectors and the Reapers in general are more than willing to work through the system rather than around it, even though they could hypothetically work around it, especially if we can't beat them conventionally. I mean, if we can't beat them conventionally, there's no reason for them to use things like tactics or strategy or manipulation or indoctrination or anything, right? Just making the point. Point being... We get to the point where it's like, all right, um, we have a mission. We need a really good biotic. That's you. You want to come along? And her response is basically, yeah, I'll do it in exchange for Cerberus's files. Because she is thinking like she always is. That this is just another crew that wants to use and abuse her. And that once she does so, she'll go ahead and get something out of it in exchange. Because that way she doesn't come out empty-handed. And then she'll go on her separate path. This leads to something else about Mass Effect 2. You can really screw up in Mass Effect 2. You couldn't really in 1. Not really. Other than getting Rex killed, there was no real way to be just a horrible, despicable person or to really screw things up with the people. In Mass Effect 2, you can screw up so badly, literally no one survives except for Joker. A among other problems, obviously. I bring this up with regards to Jack first, because while a lot of these are romance options, including, uh, I think Zaid, no, I'm sorry, I think Miranda and Jacob and Jack are all romance options. I'm not actually sure about that to me, but I know Jack is. Because what you can do is you could start to express interest in Jack, and she'll immediately be like, so you want to have sex? you can be like, yeah, sure, let's have sex, okay. And if you do so... Like, right off the bat, without knowing this person, without understanding this person, you have basically just screwed her over and torpedoed any possibility of the romance really going anywhere there. That is not a good thing to do. I mean, I know that sounds like a duh, but believe it or not, deciding to have sex with an unstable person you basically just met is probably not the best idea in the world, no matter what your thoughts are on Amory or monoamory or polygamy or whatever. It's, it's still probably not a good idea, right? And so it's logical that this goes this way. However, if you try to kind of be there for her as a friend, well, then she is naturally very suspicious and wondering what you're actually after, which makes sense given all she's been through. I point that out, though, because the one thing that really starts to reach out to Jack and to get her to open up to you and to get her to be a better person is the fact that it's repeating if you consistently, patiently reach out the hand to her every time you can. She'll notice that at some point or another, you're not really getting anything out of this. You are just taking the hits and continuing to reach out to her. And in so doing, you provide her a fundamental understanding of the fact that you legitimately care about her. And in so doing she starts to acknowledge the possibility that someone cares about her, 
which, if you'll remember, is kind of an alien thought to her at this point in time. So she likes that idea a lot and decides to kind of start flip-flopping in a more positive direction into being actually your friend, into actually caring, which, of course, can lead naturally into her loyalty mission. She asks, She finds the spot, and it's the space where they programmed her, where they built her. Now, Miranda says this wasn't authorized, that it wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Cerberus is a cell-based organization, so I would firmly believe that Miranda either didn't know about this or didn't approve of this, but nothing happens in Cerberus without the elusive man knowing about it. So, um, anyways. If you ever wonder why I can't call the elusive man a good man, Jack. <laughs> I don't really need to say anything else. So we go there, and it's almost entirely just about her and her past, about how they raised her, about how they tried to indoctrinate her, deliberate reference, about how they, they flooded her with drugs when she's tried to kill people to build into her the autonomic chemical response of liking killing, zapping her when she hesitates, just all sorts of horrible stuff. But um, in the end... She looks at it and she's like, I just, this is all messed up and wrong and horrible. And I just want to be gone. I just want to be gone. And she blows it all to hell. I want to come, I want to stop coming back here, Shepard. That's the line that stuck with me. It still sticks with me to this very day. I want to stop coming back here. I never want to dream about this stupid room ever again. And I feel her on that one. So, it's the end of that one. But I mentioned, her parallel to Jacob and Miranda, and I suppose I should bring that up. So first of all, there's several conflicts that happen with the crew, and you can resolve them in a number of ways, which can basically lead to a positive flag or a negative flag. By the end of the game, you want as many positive flags as possible. It is possible to have, I think, three negative flags uh, on specific people. Zaid, I know, is one of them. But still, through careful, uh, through careful interaction, still make sure everyone gets to the suicide mission alive. But obviously the ideal is to have all positive flags, which pretty much guarantees it unless you really screw up on the other two things, which I'll talk about when we get there. But uh, the comparison between the two kind of helps to showcase it, because Miranda and Jake, Jack both were designed against their will to be something they didn't want to be, and have since decided to start using it for the... You can see the parallel there, it's obvious. The big difference is that while Jack wears all her emotions on her sleeve, Miranda tries to keep them quiet and hidden behind the, behind the mask. Miranda, of course, is the professional, but Jack ultimately is the one who's more likely to do what needs to be done in order to accomplish things, thus kind of showing them as inverse of each other. But Jacob's relation is interesting to me, because ultimately Jack really is a chaotic good person, just like Jacob is. The problem is Jack has been through hell in a handbasket, this is why it takes so much time and effort to reach out to this poor woman and actually get her to acknowledge and accept the fact that she can be a good person, which she is in three. I, I have to admit that did make me smile. But in order to really reach out to her, in order to really get her to the point where she can embrace and accept who she is, requires a lot of time and effort to undo a lot of the damage that's been done to her. But at her core, I firmly stand by the idea that she is a good person just like Jacob is. So you can see the, the obvious comparisons between the three. <sighs> now I'm going to talk about Rex briefly here. I swear it's relevant. So, Rex, this is when Rex gets a lot of characterization. Uh, it, he did get a decent amount in the first game, but if he is alive, and he is right, then he gets a huge amount of characterization in this game. We see that Rex is probably one of the single biggest reasons why the Krogan have a chance for the future. Yes, single-handedly. He has sufficient motivation. He has sufficient long-term wisdom and intellect. He has sufficient charisma and personal strength and political power. And basically, he has everything that is needed to become the leader of the Krogan people and shove them into modern society like it or not. If it wasn't, if you don't have someone that, all of those attributes, like Rex is, well, then you get someone like, I think it's Reeve, who is there instead, who is a petty, pathetic little individual who's only real interested in his own scale problems and his own clan. 
we actually see several other uh, Krogans who are above the cut of the usual, I like fighting because it's fun, but even they are still not really with the long-term mentality that's necessary for the kind of uh, cultural renaissance, frankly, that the Krogan people need. My personal favorite is the guy who gives the big speech during Morden's loyalty mission about we shall burn the citadel and destroy the Asari and we shall eat the Salarian eggs as a delicacy and just this whole speech about how they're just going to ravage and destroy the entire galaxy and it's like yeah that right there that's the alternative I don't know if Rex can succeed but he's the only one I think who can well Rex and Eve but that's not here nor there Rex doesn't have any missions related to him personally you know what he does have well, you get this mission to go get this warlord, this great and powerful Krogan warlord. And it's like, okay. And this warlord, well, he's kind of decided, philosophically, to see that the Krogan are wrong. See, the Krogan have such ridiculous birth rate that they give birth to lots and lots of Krogan. So they tend to zerg swarm their way over everything. That's how they've kind of been for a long time. Okay, sure. He believes elsewise. He's like, no, there must be weight. <laughs> He believes that rather than having a bajillion level one Zerg, he would rather have one level bajillion Zerg. One hybrid instead of 100 Zerglings, to put it into simplistic terminology. So he's been building this for a while, working, manipulating, uh, trying to get this going. I forget which group he works with. As I mentioned in the last game, our main opponents of this game are actually the three various mercenary factions on the underbelly of society, because most of this game is spent in the underbelly of society. Oh god, I forgot to talk about the visual comparison thing. I'll bring it up later. Ah, screw it, I'll talk about it now. So most of this game, ha obviously, is more of the underbelly of the galaxy. The first game, white-collar crime, right? Corrupt executives, corrupt bureaucrats, corrupt politicians, slightly less corrupt politicians, even more corrupt politicians. Like, that was most of what we were interacting with, dealing with, right? And, of course, our main overall enemy was the Geth, because those are the nameless mooks that Saren was throwing at us. In this game, we find out, uh, we go to, we, we're no longer official. We're no longer part of the standard channels. So, aside from a few visits to the Citadel, we're mostly going to the places that are not commonly frequented. Going to rim worlds, going to, um, you know, criminally common places, you know, that kind of a thing, right? And in so doing, we see the other side of things. Now, it's worth noting that it's not, not all Moss Eisley. It's not all grit and guck. We do go to Ilium, I think? Oh god, I can never think of the name of the planet. There's an Asari planet which is basically, uh, as long as you have a binding contract, that binding contract is law. So technically everything's legal as long as you legally obtain it. In short, if you just shoot someone on the street, that's illegal. If you walk up to someone and pay him and say, here, I'm going to give this money to your family. Here, sign here, sign here, double note here, okay? And then shoot him on the street and show it to the authorities, that's legal. It's actually one of the most fascinating places in the entire setting, in my opinion, because of the nature of that dynamic and how that showcases it as just, just an absolutely free market, which is just terrifying and horrifying and wonderful. But anyways, point being, even there, while it's still kind of white-collar crime, is still kind of the underside of it that you wouldn't normally see. It's the kind of stuff that uh, most of the major corporations wouldn't really interact with on an everyday level like they do with most of the other planets we saw in the first game. This, of course, gets across the different visual aesthetic of the second game, which is far more Star Wars-y, just to say it as bluntly as possible. Star Wars has always had a lived-in aesthetic. You know, it looks... Everything in Star Wars tends to look, well, at least in the original trilogy, tends to have that look of just kind of, you know, it, it's seen some wear and tear, right? It, it's, it's been in operation for a while. It's the same kind of thing here. Most of the armor, most of the places we go to, all look like places that, they're not disgusting per se, except for, you know, the frickin' asteroid, but for the most part, what we see is places that look like they have been in use for a while. It's far less pristine, and it's far less plasticky than the first game. So visually, as well as in the overall tone of the story, it differentiates itself from the first game, which leads me to Grunt. I swear I was going to tie this back in somehow. Grunt is not the perfect example that actually Liara would probably be the perfect example of this. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about Liara. Instead of talking about Grunt, because this follows more naturally. Professional. Because Liara in the first game is squeaky clean. She's naive and innocent, and she's brilliant, of course. But she's still, you know, oh man, 
And the second game, we could see that she has come to realize a little bit more of exactly how the galaxy works and what it takes to make things work. And she has become an information broker. A very good one, by all accounts. Very, very good at her job. And she has been in this position of trying to do things and interact with things. In fact, we find out she has been trying to track down us and find us for some time prior to our body being recovered. So that's interesting. As a further addendum, she, like Rex, is not actually a, a playable character, at least not for the most of the game. Uh, instead, she is an NPC in this case where she helps us with a few things, but for the most part she's just kind of there. Until we do the Lair of the Shadow Broker, which I am going to go ahead and talk about now. Now let me just go ahead and say that Lair of the Shadow Broker is my favorite DLC in the whole franchise, although I will admit the arrival comes close. Lair of the Shadow Broker is awesome for many reasons for me, not the least of which because of the fact that it tends to wink at the audience several times because of the nature of how much it makes fun of Mass Effect 1, but also because of the fact that it's, it, it varies up the gameplay substantially at multiple times. It also concludes a story arc that has been building since the first game. Oh, not Liara's. If you'll remember, in the second area of Mass Effect 1, so first we have that mission, right, on, I forget the name of it, planet. Then we go to the Citadel. In the Citadel, one of our first main plot arcs is directly connected to the Shadow Broker. We get a little bit of information about him, and if you read the backstory stuff, you find out that he is an information broker who very carefully manipulates and maintains a series of balance points across all the other major powers. And when I say major powers, I don't just mean the nations. I mean everyone. He plays everyone across against everyone else. Now, the thing is, he also basically forces you to play his game. He has such a good and extensive intelligence network that if it's basically impossible to keep most things safe from him. He, you actually get access to some of it in the game, and it's ludicrous the amount of information he has. But the relevant point is if you don't play the game, if you don't give him information or sell to him or deal with him, well, then he ousts you to your enemies. And in so doing, you are now at a disadvantage or possibly just killed, who will then be replaced by someone who is more willing to play the game. He's at a very, very unique position, and actually one of the more fascinating criminal characters in fiction in general, in my opinion, because while he has ridiculous wealth and influence and power, almost all of that is constantly spent maintaining his position as this very delicate stack of cards is maintaining him right at this one spot, right in the middle of all the other major players. And he has to work constantly to maintain that. It's almost like the act of doing so is more interesting than the rewards from doing so. Now this is interesting considering that Liara ends up becoming the Shadow Broker, the third Shadow Broker herself. I say third, it is presumed that she's the third. She could be later, we're not sure. Anyways, we go through, we help to rescue the, the dude who was trying to find us. We defeat the Shadow Broker. She becomes the Shadow Broker. And we get a few really awesome scenes with Liara. But I want to talk about one thing really quick. It is not often that romance impresses me in fiction, because it's usually not romance. I want to give special praise to the voice acting and, and direction in If You Happened to Have Romanced Liara in 1, and then choose to continue romancing Liara in 2. Because of the fact that Liara tries very hard to ignore any previous relationship, to just push it out of her mind and to try to be professional and be distant. And Shepard, who is like, oh my god, it's you, she's been without you for a couple of years at this point. Like, she is coming from, at this from a completely different angle, and she has no idea how to process it. And this comes across repeatedly throughout the course of the arc. By the end there, she actually starts to talk and be like, okay, I don't know if we should do this, and I don't know if this is a right thing, and blah, blah, blah. And it's very obvious from the way she's saying it that she does still obviously very much care, carry feelings for you. She does obviously care about you in a not just a romantic sense, but in a larger scale romantic sense. That she actually cares, and not just that she thinks you're hot. And that's important distinction, because then if you decide to go ahead and comfort her and silence her and say, it's okay, we can make this work, she, all, her only response to that is, in tears, okay. Okay. And that's all she has to say there. It's wonderfully done. 
And it, like I said, it's it's rare I see romance done that well, especially in a video game, but in fiction in general. And I wanted to give special praise to that moment. Now, <laughs> what I was intending to do was talk about Liara and then segue to Rex, but I've already talked about Rex. Because the point is both Liara and Rex are not playable, not really, in this one. Instead, this leads us to Grunt. Grunt, uh... Well, Grunt is Steve Blum at his Steve Blummiest, which I think is a good thing. Some people tend to disagree with that. Um, <laughs> he's... It's hard to put a handle on him because he's probably one of the closer characters to being a two-dimensional character rather than a fully three-dimensional character. But a lot of that's because of the fact that he's like a few weeks old over the course of the game. Almost everything he knows is what was beamed into his brain in the pod, right? So you can kind of forgive him on this one. He also does have some layers to him, despite the fact that he's, you know, rawr. And so if you break him out, he naturally charges you and is like, all right, I demand information. This is what must be. I've decided to go with you because you've convinced me. And then if you say, good move, you then reveal that you've had a gun to his chest this entire time. Now, not only is that a bit of an establishing thing for Shepard, who was willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Krogan without flinching, but it also is a thing for Grunt, who... Well, to put bluntly, he's he's not like Rex. Rex is intelligent. He has long-term thinking, he is adaptable, and he is skilled. He is a tactician and a leader. Grunt is a battering ram. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. But you notice that this does firmly dist distinguish the two from each other. Because Grunt's approach is very, very blunt. He is a charger. He, There's a problem over there, let's go! And it's not like he doesn't understand greater concepts such as honor or dignity or clan rights or whatever. He even claims Shepard as his battle master, which, knowing Krogan culture, is a huge frickin' deal. But the overall point, though, is that ultimately he is simple, but simple is not bad. Chief O'Brien is simple. Doesn't make him a bad character, right? I haven't talked much about his mission. I do have to say, taking out a Thresher Maw on foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enough said, really. You have to go prove yourself by killing some enemies and a Thresher Maw shows up. Moving on. Let's talk about a few of the other side characters. So there's Samara, Thane, and Legion. Now, Samara is interesting because... Gosh, how do I describe this? You ever have someone who... I've seen a couple characters like this in fiction, where they have a code that they follow, regardless of all other circumstances, even if they disagree with it, and in fact, even though they frequently disagree with it. But they have to follow the code because, insert reason here, that's, that's Samara, in a nutshell. I like her, don't mistake me. And I'm going to talk about why I like her, but the code is part, part of the core parts of her character, and it does help to both distinguish her and diminish her, I think, because it effectively reduces some of her freedom of will in the matter. She does, however, follow the code. It, it's, it's kind of like the Ilium thing, which I hope I'm saying the name of that planet right. In short, it's perfectly legal so long as you do it right. Notice that when you go to recruit her, you recruit her effortlessly. There's no real recruitment mission. Yeah, I'll join you, as long as you take care of this thing that I was about to deal with. Contract transferred, everything's cool. We're now nice and legal. And that I keep stretching that word legal, because that's kind of how she tends to think in terms of legality, in terms of what is allowed by this code that she follows. You notice that, based on the way the code is structured, there's a pretty good chance that she was actually going to kill what is an innocent police person doing their job, who doesn't want to do anything elsewise, because the code would forbid the inf interference. Yeah. That's taken true neutral to an extent, isn't it? But she's not true neutral, is she? She cares. She loves. And, well, we find out that the main reason that she's got gotten into this whole thing for as long as she is, is she's chasing after Morinth, which is her loyalty mission. Now, I want to take a quick aside to say something here. You can side with Morinth. It's actually harder to do than you'd think. You have to do a couple of very specific setups or tricks in order to make sure that... And, and you have to have a really high uh, resistance meter, whatever it is, uh, Paragon or Renegade meter, in order to be able to resist her mind control, in order to side with Morinth. Otherwise, you side with Samara. Um, 
siding with Morinth is portrayed as if it is a renegade action. I really don't agree. Renegade is about uh, you know, the, the, the method, the operation, being willing to accomplish certain things to accomplish certain goals. Okay, and it's certainly not good, per se. It's not polite or diplomatic or whatever. But it's also not straight-up evil. Siding with Morinth is straight-up evil. And the game makes that very clear. There's no way Shepard knows that she's, she or he is doing anything other than something abysmally horrifying. This is also ignoring the fact that in order to side with Morinth, you are turning on your ally, who is on your side, who has been sworn to help you, so long as you don't bypass certain problems, in exchange for someone who is not your ally, who is a sociopath, who takes pleasure from killing. Yeah, no, that's actually, it, I, I'm sure the option's a nice thing, you know, options are good, but that's not a renegade choice, that is an evil choice. And that's always bothered me. Moving on. One of the interesting things, though, about Morinth is that Morinth kind of showcases... <sighs> Morinth is basically an insight into Samara's character. Samara is someone who... Code. Morinth is someone who says she has a code, but doesn't. She actually says several things. It's always this, or it's always that. I prefer this way. It's always better this way. She, those are all lies, and those are proven in the interactions with her. No, Morinth is someone who is only who's, who's a true, classic sense of the word hedonist. All she cares about is how much pleasure she can rip out of life before she moves on. That's all. And she doesn't care about how many other people she kills or tortures or destroys in the process. Uh, and again, that's all. Now, why did, what does this have to do with Samara and her presentation? Samara, for all her code adherence, has someone underneath that. We see brief insights into this, because she is obviously bothered by what her daughter has become. And she, she doesn't understand you know, why this has gone this way, and she feels guilty because she feels it's her fault, because she's the one who made her an Arak Yakshi, and blah, 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 blah. You can see that this is bothering her. But the difference is, Morinth, by all will and choice, decided to be a disgustingly evil person who butchers people and mind controls villages and so forth and so on. Samara chooses to be a better person. And this, of course, gets across the variance between the two. There's a quote that Samara gives at the end of her thing. I am a ruined and broken vessel, but I am finally free. I really like that quote. Thane. I'm, I'm trying really hard not to make a firefly joke here. The man they call Thane. Thane is also interesting. I suppose they're all interesting, aren't they? Hmm. I don't dislike any character in Mass Effect 2. That says something. Thane is, of course, an assassin, although he has a very philosophical approach to things. Because he's not an assassin because he loves killing. He's an assassin because he's really, really good at it. And he is damned good at it. He's probably the best assassin in the entire game. Possibly in the galaxy? I mean, he's, he's top tier is what I'm trying to say. You'll notice, however, that he, the, the targets he goes after, he goes after almost entirely because he believes they deserve to die for some reason or another, at least from the few we see. Obviously, this was not always so, given the story about him and his, his wife and you know, all that fun stuff. He's also dying of a sickness that is actually regular to his people, so that's fun. So he has a limited amount of time left, and he is someone who, you know, is trying to do good by precisely killing in short, he is arguably the ideal of a member of the Assassin's Brotherhood over in Assassin's Creed. Someone who looks at the situation and, with the precision of a very, very fine scalpel, reaches in to remove the tumor in an intent to make things better. And notice, once again, all these people, with very few exceptions, are generally good aligned. It's just interesting to think about, considering the circumstances. Anyways... Now, Thane's recruitment mission is fun. It's also the source of that renegade interrupt I mentioned earlier. Because he's running around trying to kill a woman who is so stupid and evil that she's literally getting her own workers killed in a extremely stupid and evil way to try and save her own life. <laughs> Which doesn't work, of course. And he just laments the whole thing. When we tell him what we're up against, he signs up without hesitation. Because of course he does. I mean, what else has he got going on? It's not like he's got an estranged son who... oh. Now, I like that loyalty mission. 
Partially because it involves Bailey, who I haven't really mentioned yet. There's a lot There's a lot of NPCs. If I just sat here talking about all the characters, we'd be here all day, and my throat's already hurting. So, that's not happening. <laughs> you want to you see an in-depth thing? In-depth, in-depth? Go watch the stream. <laughs> Bailey is a good example of someone who's a good cop in a corrupt cop system. Kind of like what Garrus was back in the first game. So Bailey comes across as very understandable and respectable and, well, when I say respectable, I mean someone you can respect. And, of course, he, he is intimately tied in with Thane's quest, just like he's tied in with Garrus's quest. Thane's quest, I'll get to Garrus later, Thane's quest leads him to try and interact with his son, to, to reach out to his son to be like, hey, you know, don't, don't follow my path, don't do the, what I did. Just because I was good at it, just because it was the path for me doesn't mean it's the path for you, blah, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. But the really interesting part is it ends, and the two argue, because Thane made mistakes, and when they leave, the result is, we're talking. I like that. Their issues aren't resolved. Their relationship isn't salvaged. Instead, they have begun to resolve it. And that is very realistic and believable and heartwarming and awesome. And, of course, Bailey offers to kind of go easy on the kid and offer him a way to, you know, get out of the, the criminal underbelly thing, to, to bypass the bureaucratic red tape that is so much of an issue. A lot of this game, by the way, is spent deliberately bypassing or avoiding red tape, which is fascinating in its own right, if you think about it. Anyways. This leads me to Legion. Now, I like Legion, all 1,183 of them. <laughs> in Mass Effect 1, we spent the whole game fighting Geth. Here's a Geth who's on our side. Oh, there's two types of Geth. Okay, that makes sense. Because now, the last game just kind of made it seem like all of the Geth were with the Reapers. This game makes it seem like a relatively small sect of the Geth were with the Reapers, which actually makes a lot more sense, if I'm being honest. As Legion himself points out many times, especially in the third game, joining the Reapers is monumentally stupid of a thing to, for the Geth to do. We also get our biggest insights into Geth culture and Geth society here, although that will come up even more in the third game. The general idea is that each Geth is a program, but it's a very limited program. I, like, notepad, you know? <laughs> Nothing super extensive. Now, I'd, I'd, obviously they have the ability to think, and they, can, they have the ability to reason to some extent, but they all have to talk and interact, and basically all 1,183, excuse me, need to reach consensus in order for Legion, the overall construct, to act. Now, this is actually relevant in its own right, because the entire way Legion is portrayed, assuming you don't sell him off to Cerberus because you're a heartless bastard, or get him killed in the suicide mission, or don't activate him, and I feel like there's another way to get him killed before you get to the end of 3. Anyways, the point being is as you interact with Legion, you find out that all of the various pieces of Legion... <sighs> trying to think how to phrase this. I would argue, personally, that the Geth are not truly sentient and sapient in the same way we are, or that other fully-fledged fully AIs are. That, in short, the Geth can emulate being sentient and sapient by a sufficient interaction of enough separate Geth, basically forming a large enough, enough pattern and thought space in order to emulate true sentience and sapience, hence someone like Legion, who, if you remember, is a special model designed to carry way more geth than usual, specifically so he is better uh, suited for this kind of thing. You'll also notice he has been specifically reaching out to us to try and be the first actual interaction between the organics and the geth in however long. So, that's there too. We can learn a lot about the geth and how they function and all that, but it is wonderful how sufficiently alien they are. Again, probably at least in part because they are intelligent, but arguably not truly sentient and sapient. Which, of course, leads us to the big problem. And one of the bigger dilemmas in the game. What, uh, what do you do about the heretics? Because there's only two choices. Wipe them out. Or reprogram. Mind control them, effectively, to be better. Now, this isn't as bad as it sounds, because we're not indoctrinating them. In fact, what we are doing is repairing an error in their programming. But... No matter how you slice it, we are mentally altering them at a fundamental level. So which is better? I'm not going to give any judgments on this one. I'm just posing the question, because that's exactly what his loyalty mission does. Which do you choose? And 
Legion himself, themselves, don't actually come to a consensus on this one. They are so split, they turn to us and make us decide. In other words, they make you decide, the player. Because screw you. <clears throat> like the Vermeyer thing, there's no third option here. Pick one or another thing, and what you pick, and for your own reasons, well, not only does it say, say something about you, but it also allows you to justify it, or lack of justify it, based on your own opinions. Because they're both bad options, if you think about it. And arguably, they're both good options, too. Depends on how you look at it. I suppose this is as good a time as any to talk about Morden. You'll notice I've been kind of dodging around him. Morden might be my favorite character uh, of, of the playables, of, of the party members. And that's saying something. Although it helps that he had probably the best overall arc in Mass Effect 3. He... Tali and uh, and Legion, the guy I was just talking about, all have the best stuff in Mass Effect 3. So they got good stuff in 3 and 2. And 1, in Tali's case. But anyways, I'm getting off topic. So, Morden... I don't know how to properly explain why I like him so much. He is... He's another ex good example of chaotic good. But I've heard some people say he actually qualifies better as chaotic neutral, leaning towards good. See, the thing is, Morden very much wants to help people. That is his core driving force, helping people. He's also a doctor. But he, to put it in simplistic terms, has sworn no oath. He sees all situations as a way to try and help people. Let me, you remember that dilemma I brought up earlier about Zaid? Do you kill the Joker or do you save the ten people? Morden's the kind of person who would look at that and say, well, I should kill the Joker. Why? Because that will save more lives later down, that line. Because that, in short, Morden is a strange example of a character who fully acknowledges that killing people can help people. And doesn't, well, he doesn't become a zealot about it. He doesn't embrace it. He doesn't turn into Frank Castle. Instead, he just acknowledges it as a cold, quiet, logical reality. That's another interesting thing about Morden. Despite being almost universally morally aligned, everything he approaches is from an intellectual bent. He even understands himself well enough to effectively manipulate his own feelings. He also is the source of probably one of my favorite quotes in the entire franchise. No, not the song, although that's probably his big meme thing. No, I'm talking about his favorite nephew. So we go to recruit him. He's trying to fix a, a virus that is a cross-species virus, which they mention is very dangerous. We help him out. We recruit him. His loyalty mission is awesome, and I'll get to that in just a second. But as he's talking about it, he mentions he can't think of it in terms of saving the galaxy. Because the standard mind cannot process the galaxy. You know what the standard mind can process? My favorite nephew. In my case, it's actually probably my favorite niece, but you get the point. He understands intellectually the stakes, but he emotionally has redirected his attention onto the individual so that it's more personal to him. So that he now has a direct investment in it. That's Morden, the geeky, intellectual, willing-to-kill-if-necessary doctor who is brilliant and ultimately loves his nephew so much that he'll go on a suicide mission to try and save him. Do I even need to explain why I like Morden so much? It helps that the voice actor is awesome. Now, uh, Morden's loyalty mission... I've talked about this so many times, and I've I got to be honest, I don't want to talk about this in full detail here. I mean, I've got to have been, already been talking for like an hour or so, my throat is killing me. <laughs> uh, Morden's loyalty mission is about the Genophage. Morden was one of the people who helped build the Genophage to begin with. Now, I didn't really mention the Genophage, even though it was relevant in the first game, because one of the reasons Rex and was thinking about going with Saren and his crew was because Saren was offering a fake solution to the Genophage, in exchange for total obedience, which is why Rex finally decides not to go with it. In addition to that, there's the fact that, uh, you know, the Genoph so the Genophage, oh god, <sighs> the Krogan, I told, I said this already, the Krogan Zerg, they have tons and tons and tons and tons of children. The Genophage ensures that most of those don't actually get born which I want to stress doesn't mean that the women in question don't have children. 
it means that the children are not born. Now, that's an important distinction because it helps to highlight just how horrible and awful the genophage really is. It is also probably, in my opinion, one of the best constructed dilemmas in the entire franchise. Because the Krogan, let's be completely honest with ourselves here, are a problem. Now, the real problem is the uplifting, the, the, the reckless and foolish uplifting of the Krogan in order to use them as ammunition against the Rachni. That's the problem. That's the core issue. That was the wrong choice. I think we can all agree on that. However, once that was done, now we're left with the results. Now what do we do about it? Now what are our options? And the harsh problem and harsh reality here is that the Krogans don't, well, really gel with the rest of society because they didn't earn it. This, by the way, is one of the cases in which the Prime Directive would fit very firmly, would actually apply universally and, and without question. For those of you who don't watch my Star Trek stuff, I am extremely anti-Prime Directive, mostly because of the way it's implemented, not because of the core concept. Because the whole point of the core concept is let's not take people from the 1920s and give them spaceships, to put it into simplistic terminology, because they haven't earned it. They don't understand the consequences of what they're doing. They have no appreciation for, for, for what they have or what they're doing. Their society at an individual and a macroscopic level is not ready for being part of the galactic stage. But, hey, congrats, we just jumped you forward 200 years. So now the Krogan, who are culturally and genetically and individually just not ready for the galactic stage, are now this huge massive force, and then we have the Krogan rebellions. <laughs> which uh, was a long, bloody, massive war. And the solution to the Krogan Rebellions was the Genophage. Now, this is why I, I say this in such neutral terms. To be clear, the Genophage is horrible. But what were the alternatives exactly? First alternative was just dying. So then we have a Krogan-dominated galaxy, the Reapers move in, and everything's dead. Okay, that's the first option. Second option, genocide. Wiping out the Krogan people, just to a man. Yeah, I'm not sure that's really a good option. That's assuming it's even possible. So what other options do we have? Oh, that's right, none. This is why the genophage is such a horrifying thing. And I, I've talked about this before. I spent weeks debating this one. When Mass Effect 3 was still coming out, um, when, you know, when we hadn't come out yet, and I was anticipating which choices would have major effects on the third game, I figured this would be the biggest one by far. Because if you sit back and look at the, the galaxy and look at all the choices you make, choosing to help cure or not cure the genophage is probably one of the biggest choices because it removes that cap on the Krogan, which can lead to another Krogan rebellion, which, as I said earlier, can either lead to total annihilation or uh, genocide. Take your pick. And that's not cool. So... I, I debated this, and I argued this for so long, and I was so not sure what to do about this one. As I've said before, the thing that finally changed my mind was Rex. The individual. The belief in faith in the, the charismatic leader to turn the Krogan into something other than the Krogan Rebellions. The funny thing is we never actually find out the consequence of that, because Mass Effect 3, though it does take this into account, don't mistake me, and it's one of the better missions in Mass Effect 3... The long-term galactic consequences, we'll never know that. But it says a lot about Morden that he's okay with either choice, for different reasons. Because that's how he is. He thinks and he feels he is a morally aligned intellectual. So, either way. <sighs> Two more characters, I swear, and then we're done. <laughs> like, <laughs> because I want to talk about Tali, and I want to talk about Garrus. Now, Rex is my brother, but Garrus, Garrus has got my back. I've always, I'm obviously, I know, I've always liked Garrus, I know, shocking thought. But what I like, uh, you can also romance him this time around. In fact, you can romance Tali as well, so that's neat. But, um, <clears throat> which is interesting because both of them have uh, biological problems in between you and romancing them. It's okay, you know, cross-species romance is fine. You just got to think about it carefully. Not, we're not all a sorry, after all. Garrus is, of course, a renegade. He's always been a renegade. But what we see here is that he is now a bit of a bitter, broken renegade. He barely gives any reaction to seeing Shepard at first. 
All he's thinking about at the moment is the mission. Now he's good. They call him Archangel for a reason. And he's got this he's his, he's got his sniper rifle, he's got his wits, he's got his skill. He is damn good. He's probably I'd say the second deadliest overall person in the galaxy besides us in terms of what he can do. He is hampered by his guilt and his dread and, you know, the fact that he was doing it basically alone. Oh, don't mistake me, he had a squad, but his squad got sold out and that led to some problems and now he's all alone. And you could see Garrus doesn't handle being alone all that well. He handles it very well, but not all that well. Although that makes sense, it's not like Shepard is anything without her squad after all. I keep saying her, by the way, because my shepherd was female. I apologize. But you get the idea. Garrus, so we recruit him, rescuing him from the Mercs, pretty much immediately putting us in their crosshairs, by the way. And as we're doing so, we see just how worn down and broken he is. In fact, he gets damaged in the process of the mission. It's okay, it's repairable, and he gets this awesome cybernetic scar thing going on. But what really brings him to the fore is when he has to deal with the guy who sold him out who is this broken, disheveled mess, who regrets it, who hates the fact that he did it, who almost would be glad to be killed. Now, you can let Garrus kill him or let Garrus spare him. And the funny thing is, in either direction, Garrus still moves forward as a person. It's just for different reasons. Because the point is, Garrus hasn't had closure here. That's the point. It's just this open-end wire just sitting there sparking electricity that's been bothering him ever since. Once it's closed, he can now decide to go ahead and say, okay, I'm going to move forward, do some calibrations, and figure out exactly how he wants to think about things going forward. And, of course, we can be a, a spot of sunlight on him or a hand dragging him forward, depending on how we approach it. I love how he compliments you, by the way, if you romance him. You have a good hip shape, I think. So that leads me, of course, to Tali. Now, I'm talking about her last because, uh, well, mostly because of coincidence, but because I wanted to talk about the big two last, Garrus and Tali. Uh, she's... <sighs> Garrus and Tali both relate to each other, not just because they end up romantically involved in Mass Effect 3, if you don't romance either of them, which actually is a pretty good match, if you ask me. What? <laughs> I can ship my friends together, it's cool. But uh, because of the fact that both of them tried to do what we were in the wake of our absence, and both failed. Garrus, well, his squad got sold out, and he ended up not making that work. Why? Because his squad didn't have the tight-knit loyalty to each other that our squad did. Tali, she fails because well, she's not a leader. It's it, it, She has been given a leadership role, but she is not the kind of person who gravitates towards command and is able to deal with that. Leadership qualities, this it's hard, to, it's hard to explain, especially when it comes to... I've talked about the paradox of leadership. I've talked about all that is required to be a good leader and not just a, a unit commander. Tali doesn't have that kind of charisma, doesn't have that force of personality, and she doesn't have the understanding and empathy to really connect with her people or connect them to each other. And neither does Garrus. Neither of these people are good leaders. It's not an insult. It's a statement of fact. They are excellent people in their own respective fields. But they are better as part of another person's squad, like, say, ours, than they are as part of their own squad. This, of course, leads to Tali's recruitment mission, which goes very badly, as you might imagine, because of the aforementioned problem. Although it does put us on the the beginnings of figuring out what to do about the collectors, collecting information, understanding vampires, etc., moving on. Her loyalty mission is interesting because it talks about this sun that's going weird, and I'm sure that'll never come up again. I was actually thinking about talking about the, the abandoned plot elements, you know, the dark energy plot. There are several references in Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 1 to what was going to be the plot thread of Mass Effect 3, which was then torpedoed in favor of the uh, AI singularity plot thread. So what happens is there's several build-ups in 1 and 2 that go nowhere, so I don't really feel the need to comment on them extensively because they go nowhere. Anyways... <clears throat> Her loyalty mission is actually one of the simplest ones because it doesn't really involve her or really 
uh, diver, uh, delving into her as a person. I'm saying this wrong. It. So her loyalty mission has to do with the Geth, of course. And we go and find out that her father has actually been operating with some Geth stuff, which is incredibly dangerous to do, heretic Geth stuff specifically. And that has led to some problems, which leads to her being charged alongside her father because Quarian society is weird. Now, as a consequence of this, we go to her defense, and we can do this several ways. Now, this leads to an interesting dilemma, which does have a third option. So we can appeal to... Basically, we can prove that her father was guilty. So she's exonerated, and her father is is post posthumously you know, damned forever in the society of the Quarians. Or we can accept that she's guilty, so she's banished from Quarian society forever. Or we can take a third option and basically appeal to the crowd and point out what I like to call mitigating circumstances. Now, I know this is unrelated to this game. I'm just reminded of Harry Potter 5. Don't worry, it'll be relevant if you watch that video. It's coming up later. But, uh... In so doing, we have shown them that she, through mitigating circumstances, cannot by logical default be guilty of the crimes hence, hence charged of. We don't have evidence of it other than what is effectively her service record. And thanks to the rather fluid way that Quarian legal system works, this actually flies. And so she is released and she becomes Talivas Normandy. It's also worth noting this quest has one of my favorite interrupts in the entire game. The hug. In fact, I was thinking about it. Tali's quest, Garrus's quest, and Thane's quest are the ones that have my favorite interrupts in them. Go figure. So that's our whole squad. The suicide mission is one of the better constructed uh, elements in gaming ever, in my opinion. So, there's probably ways it could be even better. But it is still monumentally excellent, in my opinion. Aside from the music, there's the fact that as you've been going through the game, I mentioned there's reduced RPG elements. Most of the money and resources you get is only is, is being focused towards uh, researching upgrades on the ship, both for the ship and for the crew. In so doing, you can power up the ship to be fully powered, which if you do, you then make it to the, the collector base with everyone intact. If you don't, people die. So, point one. In the suicide mission itself, you then have to give people different roles. Now, multiple people can slot into multiple roles. There's not, I mean, there is one way to go through it that'll always work. But depending on your loadout, basically certain people, they're, they're, it's, it's branching. Who works best where will change depending on whether they have the positive flag or the negative flag and who else is going with them. There's multiple permutations and combinations of how the suicide mission can go which by itself is impressive. I mentioned how hard it is to do branching storyline. This one mission is tremendously branching, and it's, it, it's showing and telling just how insane this was to actually construct for the developers. Huge props. Then, as our, so landing, who does what, and who has positive and negative flags. These are the elements that determine who gets through what and how well or badly the mission goes. It is possible to have basically every gradient in between everyone dying and everyone living. Now, I could talk at length about the specific details. I could talk about the final boss is boring and dumb. I could talk about how, you know, the Reapers uh, exist because what they do is they combine thousands of organic lives into a single mind. That doesn't actually explain how exactly their consensus of an entire species turns into a Reaper. So there's probably some reprogramming going on. But what I really want to talk about is leadership. You know, I haven't actually talked about Shepard much. This is the value of Shepard, the suicide mission. This is what a leader is. Because what's the difference between success and defeat? Is it being higher level? Is it having more troops? Is it being more politically backed? Or more ethically backed? Or maybe it's because of the fact that you have a larger army or better guns, or you're level 75. No, no. You know what determines the suicide mission's success? Is making the right choices, and reaching out and connecting to the people, and having the equipment. That's what determines the success. Having the equipment, that's on the ship. Making sure that you reached out to the people, connecting them, either both to yourself and to each other, so each of them has the positive flag, and making sure to know what to do with the resources you have. 
that, those three elements, that is what a leader is. And that's what Shepard is. That's why Shepard is so damned valuable for Mass Effect. Not because she's super powerful or super awesome or because she's death walking or, or a Darth Vader or whatever. It's because she, I keep saying she, it's because they are that kind of leader who can unite the, the unique and excellent talents that exist in the galaxy to accomplish far more than they ever could otherwise. It leads to one of the final decisions of the game where you can destroy the facility or give it over to Cerberus because you're amazingly stupid. Look, I'm sorry. Even if you believe in the Cerberus cause, um, this is Reaper Tech, and we've already personally seen what happens when you tinker around with Reaper Tech. It can indoctrinate you even though it's off. No. <laughs> Which leads us to Arrival. Now, Arrival was uh, kind of a mid-quill DLC. They, they have another term for it, I forget it. The idea is to specifically set up Mass Effect 3. The arrival effectively happens right before Mass Effect 3. Which is funny to me, because you can actually do it before the end of Mass Effect 2. But I always do it at the end, because it just fits there so much better. The idea is, the Reapers are actually coming. They are actually showing up, and they're going to arrive <laughs> at, this, uh, at this specific relay and then they'll have access to the relay network. And then the invasion begins, because they have access to the relay network. And people aren't ready for that. Remember, we run around trying to deal with the minions of the Reapers and gather more information on dealing with these things. We're not ready for a full-on invasion yet, which is probably why they launch it now. So our only choice is to try and do something about that relay. Now here's where the game kind of cheats. Arrival has some flaws. I'll talk about it when we do the review. Um... The solo gameplay kind of sucks. <laughs> like, this is clearly a game built for having a party. and uh, But, um... <clears throat> no, what ends up happening is we end up getting captured and imprisoned and we have to break ourselves out. Somehow we're not indoctrinated. I don't know how. Don't ask me. And this is important because if we had been able to do something about it when we first arrived, no pun intended, then we would have been able to find a third option to fix this. Unfortunately, because we're knocked out and we're only woken up towards the end, we no longer have any choice. We have to detonate the relay, and we have to do it now. There is a ticking clock, and if that ticking clock happens, well, we actually know what happens, because there's a special game over screen that plays, which shows the Reapers wiping out all life in the galaxy. So there's no choice here. Yeah. So we have to take out that relay. Problem is, relays are really, really, really high-level tech. Very durable, very strong, and with tremendous power in them. Taking out a relay is basically like calling a, causing a small supernova, which is going to destroy the nearby planet and kill lots and lots and lots and lots of people. Uh, Batarians, specifically. I've heard some people complain about this, and I kind of see the point. Narratively, we are pushed into a corner, and I can kind of see why. It doesn't bother me that much, even though I think the construction of it is a little bit loose, especially compared to the rest of the game. But the point is, we have to detonate this thing, and we have to do this, because it is the only way. Otherwise, the Reapers will show up, and we will not be ready. What this will do will buy us time. The Reapers will still show up, of course, uh, but they won't be able to instantly access the rest of the network. They will have to go you know, standard FTL speeds, which is you know, much, 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 much slower. Yeah. Fun little end to things, but it's okay, because I'm sure it'll all be better in Mass Effect 3. <laughs> oh, God. Ugh. See you there, guys.